My name is Patrick McGinnis, and I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic, and it's changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show about finding the power to choose what you actually want in business and life and the courage to miss out on all the rest. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, the creator of the term FOMO, and I'm coming at you live from AW360 Studios in the global capital of FOMO, New York City. Have you ever wondered what would happen if you suddenly became famous or even infamous? You're living your life, doing your thing, and then one day, boom, you make a choice that changes everything like going on a top-rated reality TV show, for example. Overnight, millions of people know you or think that they know you, and they have all kinds of opinions about you. Crazy, right? My guest today knows exactly what that feels like because she lived it. She was the runner-up on the UK version of The Apprentice, which is one of the most watched TV shows over in England. Since then, she's found a way to leverage that experience to build several businesses and to build a unique and exciting career. Vana Kutsumidis is a master networker who believes that culture, wine, and fashion are important for connecting people. I'd agree with that. Vana is the CEO of DatePlay, a dating app where you play games to meet your match. She's also the force behind a low-calorie flavored wine called Vino by Vana, which is sold by Virgin Wines. Finally, she consults with companies about their branding and marketing strategies. A graduate of Cornell and Oxford, she speaks five languages, Spanish, Greek, French, Mandarin, and English. Hola, Vanna. Hola. I mean, that's amazing. Five, I knew you spoke at least like four languages, but the fifth, that's incredible. Um, yeah, that's the luxury of having parents from different countries because each of them speak to you in their own language and then you get to kind of absorb those two different cultures. Amazing. Um, so I like to start all my interviews with the same question. My question for you today is, what is giving you FOMO right now? Okay, so I thought a lot about FOMO over the past few days, and one of the things that I really realized is that entrepreneurship and FOMO kind of go hand in hand, but only at the beginning of your um, sort of development, right? So the reason I say that is when an entrepreneur decides to start their company, right, they're thinking, okay, I need to do this because I have a fear that someone else is going to do it if I don't. I'm fearing that I'm going to miss out on this opportunity, so I need to jump on it. But an entrepreneur cannot have FOMO during that process. So once an entrepreneur commits to doing something and moving forward, they really need to leave their FOMO at the door. So right now, I'm actually not feeling much FOMO because I'm really digging deep into date play and trying to develop the product. That is excellent. I, I think you're right. <laughs> I hear... Entrepreneurs say to me all the time, I need to get this thing out there because somebody's going to copy my idea. And my response is always, listen, uh, you, let's be honest. Your idea has probably already been tried by six or seven people or somebody is doing it right now. You cannot control the external factors. Exactly. What you can control is your reaction and the way you build your business. So you've, I've, it sounds like you learned that from experience in, in, in building Dayplay and in building the other companies that you have. Yeah, I think it's just really important to stay focused and to plow ahead and think about the future. So if I look at other entrepreneurs that I look up to and I look at the way that they lead their lives, I notice one theme, which is that they really don't allow the external noise to distract them. They stay focused, they plow ahead, they move, they move forward really just thinking about their future vision. And I think that's just what I try to maintain at all times. So I try not to let the FOMO creep in. This is good. Um, <laughs> I, okay, I'm going to keep that in mind next time I have FOMO. <laughs> so um, I want to I want to step back, go back into your history, into your. So you know we've known each other for a long time, and when I first met you, yeah. the thing that um, I mean there are lots of things to stick out about you. You're, <laughs> you're an incredible person, but one thing that you told me that was kind of mind blowing was that you were the runner up on season 11 of The Apprentice in the UK. So that. That's a big deal because in the UK, this is a top 10 show. I was looking at the ratings. I mean, you have, I'm sure it's got to be crazy. How did you end up, I mean, you're American unless you're hiding a British accent. <laughs> I never knew. How did you end up on the show? You know, what was, what made you want to do that? Mm -hmm. So I was actually doing my MBA at Oxford. And one day I saw in the group on Facebook that 
the actual administrator had posted that The Apprentice was looking for entrepreneurs. And they said, you know, 40,000 people are applying. If you have an idea, why not just like try it? So I was walking, um, at the time I was dating my husband, and I was walking over to his house and I clicked on the link and I said, you know what, I'm just gonna do it. So on the walk, on my iPhone, I decided to just apply. So all you had to do was put in your idea, put in a little information about yourself, and kind of wait. It took maximum five minutes. So I hadn't really thought about what The Apprentice was. I had actually never seen the show, wow. which was part of my strategy, because I knew that if I watched the show and I saw what it was really like, I'd probably be turned off to the experience. But I had that vision that I was telling you about for date play. I had this vision that I wanted to start a company where you play games to meet your match. I wanted to make it work. And I knew that The Apprentice was like the perfect place to publicize it, right? They have 10 to 12 million viewers a week, or approximately, and I knew that they would be a great audience for me. So I applied and then I got asked in for an interview and I just went through the process and just kind of did it without really thinking too much about what I was doing. And I think that is the key and that is what helps me so much in life, that I don't overthink things. So it's the same for when I went to China to study abroad in 2007. I wasn't thinking, okay, I'm going to China, I don't speak Chinese, like this is gonna be a disaster, you're gonna have so many problems. Instead I thought, okay, this is a great opportunity. You speak no Chinese, you're gonna to go to China and learn. It ended up being quite difficult, right? But the beauty of it was that I didn't overthink that experience. And I think I did the same thing with The Apprentice. I just kind of like jumped in head first and made it happen. That, okay, that's how I would do things. <laughs> I'm all about like jump first, figure it out later. Yeah. But um, but this is obviously a TV show where they're they're manipulating, they're producing you. Yeah. They are creating situations that I imagine are pretty psychologically stressful. Totally. And you've written about uh, what's interesting is you're. I know you. We we all know you now. After a couple of minutes, you're about as nice a person as can be. <laughs> but you were portrayed in a way that I think is. I was very like hardcore and yes. strong and um, independent. And it's really interesting that you're right. You know, you make a decision to go on one of these shows and you have to kind of release your control because at the end of the day, you're going to be produced. So we got media trained while we were after the show. So while we were kind of getting the publicity from the show. Yeah. And I think that training was really interesting because it was all about sort of remembering that anything you say can be twisted into something else. And that's what I really learned from this experience. And actually what it taught me was how to manage your personal brand. Because I think each of us have this problem now with Google, with the internet. We all are sort of in like this mini reality TV show because we're being produced in a certain aspect by the internet sites, by LinkedIn. We are also having to curate how we're perceived. So I definitely, had to go through it in a much more intense way, yeah. but I think it prepared me to um, really manage my brand. And you were sequestered, right? So that the show ends, you come out, and all of a sudden yeah. you're famous. How did you deal with, I mean, it must have been really weird. You're a New Yorker, you grew up in a city where it's almost impossible. For, I mean, you go, even if you're well-known, <laughs> people leave you alone, so it's, there's, yeah. no, there's no like celebrity in New York. Um, well, I think that what happened with me is that I didn't, so we were, as you said, we were sequestered. There were, it was about 10 weeks, 12 weeks of filming. You're in this house. You get to speak to your family about once a week. Mm. And you really feel like you're all in, right? It's like morning to night. You're filming. You're doing tasks. You're just like immersed in this program. And what I didn't realize is that you only get to pitch your idea if you reach the final two. So there were 18 of us starting out and we were competing every week and you really only get to display what your business plan is if you make it. So I was like really stressed by that. You know, I really had to make it to the end and I think that that was sort of my big achievement. And what I didn't really realize was sort was how many people were going to then recognize me afterwards. So I would go on the street and people knew my name. And um, the most memorable moment I have actually was going into my local supermarket. So my local Tesco. I went in and this group of boys came and in totally good faith, they were so sweet. I'm sure they didn't mean anything of it, but it was really scary to me because they all came up to me and wanted to kiss me. Wow. They wanted to give me kisses and hug me, and it got to the point where I was scared. So I had to call the security and say, like, you know, please, can you con control the situation? Um, but I think <laughs> that that was probably one of my sort of like eye-opening moments. 
of how powerful it is to actually be on this uh, platform. So to be on a platform that so many people view, and I do think that I was able to channel that into date play and channel it into the wine project, into yeah. Vino by Vana, rather than taking it for myself. So I think that's the differentiator for a lot of these reality TV shows. There are certain individuals who take that publicity and they want to channel it into their persona and their public image. But I do think that the wisest thing to do if you are going in for business purposes is to channel all that publicity and all that energy into your business. And that's a great segue because one of the things that you did it was really smart, which I think plays into this whole world of media and attention and social media and all the things, the crazy world we live in where there's so much information, is you took this experience, you drew upon it, you drew upon your who you are as a human being, and you created a set of businesses. So tell us about date play, and then you know we'll get into Vino by Vana a little later. Okay, so um, I was actually, I started my career off in banking, and when I was on the trading floor, it was open, it's an open floor, kind of like Wolf of Wall Street style, you know, lots of different computers sitting next to each other, and I knew everyone on the floor. There were probably like 100, 150 people on the trading floor, it was huge. And while I was there, I would throw a lot of parties, and I just like social events, you know, getting people together. And what I realized was people really wanted to get to know each other. Um, so I started this company called The City Street, which was a networking company for people in finance. And very quickly, I realized that what I thought was a professional networking company kind of became a personal networking company. And bankers wanted to meet bankers. People wanted to meet each other for it different like reasons. A terrible part. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Bankers can be so, fun too. Yeah. So they were really keen on meeting each other for dating purposes. And what I then realized was that there was really a market for matchmaking and personal matchmaking. So really like high quality consulting for you to find someone to match with for long term, hopefully. So I ended up working in matchmaking a little bit and I soon realized that it wasn't scalable. But in my first year, I made three marriages. So I was like, hey, you know, I have a knack for this. Like, some people have it, some people don't. You just kind of know what makes people tick. I just know what people need, sometimes <clears throat> a little bit more than they even know, right? So sometimes what you think you want isn't necessarily what you need. So I said, you know what? Like, this is so stressful. Getting into people's lives is like so deep and emotionally taxing. So I decided to apply to business school. So I went to Oxford and I said, okay, I like love dating. I want to do something more scalable. I need to do something with technology. What should I do? So every single project that we had for the MBA, I would do it for dating. So for example, we had to do a strategy project. You know, you choose your sector. I would choose dating. And I would talk about the strategy of the different firms, the different companies out there, the different sites. And every single class I did that. So I started to understand you get a the reputation sort of big as the, picture. As the dating person? Yes. So everyone knew that I was really into dating <laughs> and I really loved connecting people. So while I was there, I met this PhD uh, student who was studying desire. And we started talking and just kind of like having really interesting conversations about how you can create an environment that makes people connect more. Um, so we would have these continuous conversations and then one day I had this aha moment. I said, you know, I think that the biggest problem that I saw when I was matchmaking was that people didn't like the experience because it wasn't fun or engaging. Mm -hmm. What is fun and engaging? Games. So I'm going to try to create a platform where people are playing games to kind of take the pressure off the dating. So that's sort of where date play was born. I created a business plan and then I went and brought it to The Apprentice and pitched it there. Um, the cool thing about that experience was that when you're in a high pressure environment like a reality TV show, you really get to know your true self. You get to know your strengths, your weaknesses, and that process really taught me the importance of controlling what I was doing. So I really value controlling the process, but it also really taught me to let go because you really don't have control when you're in reality television. So the process of developing date play kind of developed organically. While I was on the show, we really took time to understand what people wanted and how they wanted to play, et cetera, et cetera. And then I came in second place on The Apprentice. I lost out to a plumber, um, Joseph you Valente. You say that every day. Who, no, <laughs> but he was amazing. He was so driven and ambitious. And it was just like well, a really... Well, that's a cool business too because it's like... That is just like old school, right? I think yeah. it's, and I, I and it imagine was, it's it was harder cool. for the judges to get their hands, especially in the UK where the venture capital market is a little bit behind ours. Like yeah. you're doing something that has future revenue, but it's not going to be day one. He's doing something that like you can make revenue. Exactly. It's a totally different play. It was completely different. And 
what I didn't really understand was how much publicity we were going to both get. So yeah. I, I didn't realize that like the winner gets a lot, but then also the um, runner up will get a lot of sort of exposure. So I kind of took advantage of that. I tried to really channel that all into date play. And we ended up launching the following um, Valentine's Day. And we did a crowdfunding campaign. We had all these really awesome fans and, and investors coming on board and kind of helping us build this product. So it was a journey for sure. And yeah. it's interesting because I think life sometimes, sometimes takes you in directions that you don't really anticipate. Yes. And that also makes me think a lot about FOMO. You know, you're always thinking that you need to be doing something else. You know, FOMO is kind of this feeling that you're missing out on something, right? But I think that a lot of the times life takes you where you're meant to go. So if you're also able to maintain a little bit of faith, it'll subdue your feelings of FOMO. Yeah, and you did something which is, I think, really a critical lesson for any entrepreneur. And as I listen to your story and knowing your story, of course, kind of having been there through parts of it, is that you had an area, you had a lane, you chose a lane, okay, I that, that sort of goes with your personality. You, you're good at setting people up. And I want to brag now, I have six, <laughs> I have six marriages. I don't, no way. Yeah, Amazing. Crazy. I, maybe yeah. I should join you. In exactly. Your but um, you picked a lane, which is this dating space, mm -hmm. and then you built expertise and credibility around it, you know, by starting yeah. businesses, kind of like, uh, you know, in the, in the parlance of, of the lean startup, like an MVP, a minimum mm -hmm. viable project. You tried it, you figured out it wasn't scalable. You learned from that lesson. You took this kind of idea to business yeah. school. You played with that idea in many different ways. You found the angle you thought was best. And then you used this unexpected event, this unexpected platform that you had through The Apprentice to launch your first product. So, yeah. I mean, when you think about it, it's almost, uh, and you know, in retrospect, it seems like it was so well planned and organized, but the reality is, is that you had a kind of a clear vision that you, that you executed on where you had a competitive advantage. Unlike, you know, had you been on the show and you had started a business that was super random, right? Like, okay, I'm starting a chocolate company that has nothing to do with anything that I've ever done before. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you launch that and maybe you have that hit from the show, but you can't sustain it because you don't have the actual sort of domain expertise to yeah. launch the business in a smart way. I think that's so true. And I think that passion is the driving force for entrepreneurs. So that doesn't necessarily mean that all passionate entrepreneurs will be successful, but I do think it increases the likelihood of success. And it also increases the likelihood that you'll have success at some point yeah. because entrepreneurship is so difficult, right? You know, you, you see all these success stories, but behind the scenes, there are millions of failures and there's millions of problems. But I think that the driving force and the successes is, is that passion and that resilience and not giving up at the hurdles, right? Yes. And so I think that's really crucial. So your product, so one of the things that, um, I was on this um, interview last week with a radio show here in New York called all, 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 all of it actually and okay. the, we were talking it's the, the you know I think a show is called all of it <laughs> you've got to talk about FOMO but we were also mm -hmm. talking about FOBO which is mm -hmm. if you if you're a frequent listener to, mm -hmm. to FOMO sapiens we're going to be talking a lot about FOBO which is fear of a better option which is another word that I came up with at the same time as FOMO and fear of a better option is the idea that you never want to commit to anything and this is a chronic problem in dating apps mm -hmm. as somebody who is maybe has used a yes, dating app in my day totally. sort of like swipe 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 and then you have a bunch and then you're like well I could keep swiping because you know I, yeah, I have five potential matches here and I could go but what if go someone's her, better her, her. Yeah. but like I don't know who's coming down the pike in an hour totally. and so you have this problem where you're, you're sort of like almost like you are incented not to choose how does your app avoid yeah. this problem yeah so that's actually something that we think about a lot so what we're trying to do is we're trying to change the user experience to make it more conducive to interaction and to longer interactions okay so one of the biggest problems is that we have this swiping culture and I think that that's affecting women more than men. So mm -hmm. I believe that the current offerings are created really with the man in mind, right? It's with the men's mentality. The men like to swipe and see all the options and then choose. And women actually tend to swipe left more. Women tend to really look for the person that they think is right for them. So what we're trying to do with date play is really redesign the experience to actually put the woman first, to actually make sure that the woman is dictating what they think the experience experience should be because the secret in dating is that where the women are the men will come 
You heard it here first. I'm almost <laughs> yeah. safety. It's, it's, exactly. it's true that uh, I would agree with you that, that obviously most of the people who design these companies are men and they're thinking from a male perspective. So mm -hmm. having a female founder in the dating space is critical. Um, have you found that, have you found that when you talk to women who use date play that they, it, it, they sort of feel like it's a totally different experience? Yeah, so one of the things that they really like is that we analyze your personality and we try to help incorporate that into the matching. So Wait, personality matters in dating? Personality I'm so matters. confused. I thought it was just a profile pic. <laughs> exactly. <get> <laughs> so we're trying to add that extra element of personality. So we ask you your Myers-Briggs, we ask you your five Ooh. love languages, and we try to actually make sure that you know who you're going to meet. You don't just understand someone by their picture or their quirky bio or even th through the chat. You need to know more about them. You need to know what makes them tick, right? So I think it's really helpful and women really appreciate when we tell them before a date, hey, you're meeting Patrick. He's an ENTJ. Am I right? Uh, no, I'm not an ENTJ. What are you? Don't put me in that box. <laughs> I, I can't remember. I'm like a, I'm a, I'm a strong E and a strong, uh, I think, F. Okay, um, but then the other two like, in the middle in the middle. Yeah, it's something like I'll send it to you. Okay, send it I'm to me. I'm not the typical like a Harvard <laughs> Business School is ENTJ. 93% of people are ENTJ and totally. I remember that day we took the test and they asked you to raise your hand and I felt like this weird outcast because yeah. I was like one of the three people that totally. wasn't. They did that in banking too and I'm an ENFP. So there were literally, it was that a might be me, actually. 60 person grad class and it was me and one other guy. We raised our hands and they were like, ENFPs are not conventionally good at banking. <laughs> we were like, okay. I guess that kind of makes sense. You know, it's more of the creative type. But anyway, so long story short, we're trying to understand what women want. And I think that's the most important thing. So date play is really going to be focused on the female and focused on empowering the woman and helping the woman feel good about dating. Because a lot of the feedback we've gotten, I'm not sure if you've heard about this, is that anxiety levels are on the rise. People are feeling super stressed out about dating apps. People are feeling hopeless. People are feeling like it's just so overwhelming, mm -hmm. especially because they're on several apps, right? So they're seeing all these different people, swiping through hundreds of people a day. And our brain really isn't made for that. Our brain isn't made to see all those options. It's kind of changing the biology of dating. So we kind of want to go back to the grassroots and bring people back to that authenticity of being able to just like feel that you met someone in a bookshop or feel that you met someone in a cafe, you know, yeah. bringing you back to that authentic experience. It's much healthier. I mean, it is true. If you go on a dating app and you, you could swipe through hundreds of people <laughs> in the space of, you know, a, a couple of hours, I guess. Totally. And what I've seen um, is I, I've seen people who just swipe on everybody. They don't even look. And, and then they see what matches they get and they go from there. That is a, I mean, that is. Is that FOMO? I don't know what that is. That is, that is just, that's, I think that's FOMO. And then you add the FOMO on top of it, which yeah. gives you what I call FODA, which is a fear of doing anything. But the problem is you're right. It's a paralysis and it's not healthy and it's not good for people. Yeah. And people are lonely because at the end of the day, life is not a video game. Totally. Um, life is, you know. Life is, I think, can be enhanced more by these kinds yeah. of things, but it is definitely dangerous. Now, yeah. the one solution to all these problems I have found is a nice glass of wine. Yes. And you, um, you know, when we when we first met, uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that really struck me uh, mm -hmm. about you, and you were so kind to come to my London book launch of the Ten Percent <laughs> Entrepreneur, to talk about <laughs> launching a side project while you have a, a day job, and you had this, you know, date play which is your day job. But on the side, you launch a side business called Vino by Vana, which is these really cool wines. I've had my share. Yeah. I, I've definitely partaken. Why, why did you do that? What's that all about? How's that going? Yeah, so Vino by Vana is a low-calorie, fruit-flavored wine company. So we source our grapes in France, and we add all-natural flavoring, so no chemicals, and we basically create a different wine experience. So you drink it with ice, it's very fresh, you can drink it during the day and not feel that sort of like mid-afternoon hangover. And the whole idea behind it was that we wanted to create something for women to enjoy the wine experience, especially women who don't necessarily drink wine but want to. So we were really targeting a certain demographic and my husband and co-founder Joris is from France. He's from the south of France. Yes. So we had the connection with the vineyards there and we were able to put this uh, product together. So the story behind it actually is that when I was filming The Apprentice, we kind of didn't know who was going to win or lose. Okay. Then you have a three month 
sort of hiatus break where you can't talk about it with anyone. You're not allowed to talk to the media. You're like on lockdown. And then the show goes live. So what was I thinking? I was thinking, okay, I won't find out if I won till the end, right? So potentially I'll get zero publicity. That was what my mind was thinking. So what am I going to do? I need to do something to kind of hedge myself and to make sure that all this hard work and energy and effort will actually go into business. Yeah. So that's when Yoris and I had the idea of creating Vino by Vana, and then we were able to partner with Virgin Wines, um, which is a big wine distributor in the UK, and actually get that, that project out there. And people really love it, so that's a really cool thing. Um, we're actually trying to develop it now in the US. Good idea. So, yeah. That's actually a great idea. I'm, we're, I'm, we're looking I mean, for the vineyards now. We're looking for the... It's source. a very... If you, well, if, if you're in the UK today and you're listening to this, you can just find it on Virgin Wines. And it, it is really good. It's. I remember when I first saw the bottles, I was like, what is this all about? <laughs> but then as I tried it, um, I think we served it at my book party in yeah. the UK. It was... People were loving it because I yeah. think, you know, we've moved... It's kind of like how... Uh, the way I think about the product is like, remember like 30 years ago, we had like three options of, you know, it was like soda or water. And now we have all these different kind of things that we can enjoy. And they're all little kind of spins on the mm. originals. And we have flavored water and all this other stuff. You don't always want to have red wine. You don't always want to have white wine or rosé. Yeah. And so, you know, rosé, the way it's become this major thing, I'm sure you've noticed in the U.S. Yeah. I think the an orange wine is coming. So you're kind of like on trend and probably like slightly ahead, but you could develop the whole market here. Yeah, that's the plan. So we might change the brand name, but we're definitely going to... Vino by Patrick. I love it. <laughs> FOMO Vino. Maybe. I love it. If we maybe work it should FOMO be, in... Maybe it should be FOMO Vino. So it's like... You don't have to worry about missing out on the regular selection because this is even better. Well, it's good. I'll give you the FOMO term for just a 5% royalty. <laughs> yeah, and perfect. Then, <laughs> and then we're good to go. Um, so you, you uh, we talked about in the intro, as I read your bio, you're an expert on personal branding. And you just wrote a piece for Goop yeah. about how to leverage your personal brand. So for the uninitiated or for someone who's <laughs> working on this but wants to improve, yeah. what are kind of your top tips for leveraging your brand into your business and into the world? Okay, so personal branding is becoming more and more important um, now that we have ourselves basically fully displayed on the internet. You know, you really want to take control of what's written about you and how people perceive you. So when you're interviewing for jobs, for example, the first thing that your interviewer is going to do is Google you. So you might as well control what they're going to see. The first thing I always recommend is to have one clear, crisp, professional photo that you can use across your platforms. I believe that it's really important to have uniformity because it builds trust. So if you're able to show someone that you are the same person, you have the same personality and persona and brand across the different channels, you're much more likely to be understood. It'll be much more simple and people won't feel that you're potentially lying or hiding something. So that's number one. Number two is use LinkedIn. I know a lot of people don't like it. A lot of people think it's really a hassle to create your little bio and put all your work experience, but it's a tool that you can use to your advantage. So you might as well just write a little blurb about yourself and take your personal brand into your own hands. And then my final tip is that you should be authentic when you are creating your personal brand and telling your story. Why? Because you can use me as an example. Sometimes what you plan is your career doesn't end up being your career. So I plan to be an investment banker. I plan to be on the sales and trading desk, you know, buying and selling bonds. But what ended up happening is my career evolved into something different through these different steps of the city street with the professional networking that turned into the personal networking, then going to Oxford and coming up with this idea of gaming and dating, and then going on The Apprentice, you know, all these different things. I don't try to hide any part of that journey. So it's really important to be authentic and tell the truth. So even if you feel that right now you see something as a failure, it doesn't necessarily mean it is a failure. It might just be a stepping stone to something better in the future. So those are sort of like my top tips. I and, love that. Yeah. I, well, I, have, I, I want to react to that because I totally agree. Things that you think are failures can be part of the narrative. And what's so interesting is people actually use failure in an interesting way because when they succeed, then they tell their failures. They revel in the failure because then it makes the success yeah. look even bigger. Totally. Now that, you can decide whether to do that. I'm not, yeah. <laughs> I have different views on that. But regardless, failures are opportunities to show why your narrative shifted, what you learned, and where you're pushing mm -hmm. forward. 
On the LinkedIn, I, I totally agree with you. So the LinkedIn, the challenge there, and, and if, you're, if you're watching the show and you're thinking about working on your LinkedIn, please don't call yourself a visionary unless you are <laughs> truly a visionary. I mean, I get these. So I'm very um, promiscuous on LinkedIn. Huh. I have um, 10,000 connections, okay? Yeah. I, don't, I just accept anybody because, frankly, you never know. Yeah. And um, a full 35% are visionaries, apparently. And I find yeah. that very puzzling and curious. It's, <laughs> it's just like, you, you don't have to say you're a visionary to get me to notice. It'd be much better to just be honest and say what you do every day or what you're interested in doing and, and, and go from there. Yeah, I think it's also really important to like keep it concise because I've also seen lots of essays or you know biographies that are just a little bit too long for LinkedIn. So I always say like three to four sentences maximum and just kind of tell your you can talk about your vision. So you can talk about your values. You can talk about your vision. So for example, if you are currently in finance but moving into fashion, you know, but you haven't gotten your new job in fashion, but you know that's kind of where you want to go, you can find a way to frame your bio so that it's clear that that is your end goal. So you can say, you know, I'm a financial professional with a strong passion for visual communication and styling. I uh, in my spare time, I do X, Y, Z. And so you're already kind of setting yourself up for that next step. But I think you do want to keep it concise yes. because people aren't going to read three paragraphs about you, they especially when they're just searching you for no, the first time. No, like it's um, it's you know TLDR, too long didn't read. <laughs> and it's interesting when you talk about social media, the other thing is the flip side is what not to put. So I don't want to read about your political views on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, I don't want. A per, I, I don't think it's a good form to talk about personal tragedy as much as maybe. <laughs> but I've had people. You know, I get things I, on okay. LinkedIn where people talk yeah. about things that have happened that are awful. But it's it's a it's a not. I just don't feel like it's the right place. And mm -hmm. also in general on the internet, you know, you want to check yourself on Google and see what content you have out there because I have been so interested, you know, surprised you meet somebody, you Google them and all of a sudden you're finding things about them that are right on the first page of Google mm -hmm. that are just things, pictures that are inappropriate or whatever it is. Like you really have to be vigilant about managing your personal brand, which is something that I know that you, yeah. you kind of, you do, right? Yeah, I think it's just about not being afraid to tackle your personal brand. Yeah. So a lot of the times I speak with different clients and they tell me, you know, I just don't want to do it. It's so annoying. I don't, it's so stressful and I don't want to potentially, it's kind of, there's a FOMO involved in it because I was like, I don't want to define myself because what if someone else defines me differently and then it's actually worse the way I define myself and mm. tell them, you know what, forget about everyone else for a minute. Let's think about you. What's your goal? What are your visions? What are your values? And then you can create your story without all that noise. So don't think about who's viewing you necessarily. Think about what is inside of you, what matters to you, and where you want to go. Yeah, I like that. It's, yeah. you know, chill out, have a glass of vino by Vana. <laughs> exactly. Let Vana help you figure this out or, yeah. you know, work on it yourself. And then, you know, you'll be much better. Because mm -hmm. as my brother once told me, the only thing you control in life is your reaction to what happens around you. You can't control totally. what other people do. And so, you know, that's totally. really important. So you've given us a lot to think about. I, you know, this is the show yeah. about finding the power to choose what you actually want and the courage mm -hmm. to miss out on the rest. So what what is your, if you leave us with a couple um, sort of words of wisdom about how to actually do what you want to do in life, what would they be? So I guess my biggest takeaway from the past 10 years of experience that I have is that you should really stay true to yourself and try to develop your passions. So something that I actually read in, in your book in the 10% Entrepreneur was really about that sort of curation of your own personal interests. And I think a lot of the time, you know, we have our day jobs, we need to pay the bills, we need to keep getting that income. And it's really important to actually have something on the side that makes you excited, that makes you happy, that makes you excited to jump out of bed in the morning. Mm. And I think that we'll see in the future that the best entrepreneurs are going to come out of the, this passionate mindset. So you're going to see that your life will evolve in the direction that you want it to if you're able to cultivate your passions and desires. Uh, I think so much of us, so many of us have this energy inside of us that we don't necessarily know what to do with. So, you know, we, we might like our day job or we might not like it. We might feel bored or we might still feel energized, but know deep down that we know that there's something else we should be doing. So I always think it's really important to take 10% of your time or 15% of your time and try to cure, cultivate and, you know, 
figure out what you want to be, who you want to be, what you want to be in the future. So I think that's my sort of biggest piece of advice is don't let life happen to you. Try to take control of what you're doing and figure out what you love and kind of plow your way ahead on your own terms. Love it. Totally agree. Yeah. Where can we find more about you? Um, you can go to my website at vanakutsumitas.com, but my Greek last name is like very, very <laughs> difficult to pronounce. So you can just um, look up dateplay.com. So okay. D-A-T-E-P-L-A-Y, dateplay.com, and you'll find information about me there. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much for Thank joining me so today. Thank you so much. It was so fun. <laughs> So today I am starting out with a brand new segment on the show, which is called the Faux Moment of the Week. Faux Moment of the Week. Get it? FOMO Moment, all put together. <laughs> and the Faux Moment of the Week for this week is about a new product that I saw, which has been developed by Hotel Tonight. So I have trouble when I travel picking that, you know, that hotel or that flight or whatever. I am the king of FOBO, which as we talked about earlier, is fear of a better option. I just don't want to decide and I wait until the last minute. And the engineers and marketers at Hotel Tonight figured out that people like me can actually be persuaded to make a decision. And they came up with something called the Daily Drop, which is basically a product that uh, gives you 15 minutes to decide on a super special deal for that day. And so I, this is not an ad. They're not paying me to say this, but I checked it out. And I have to say the Daily Drop actually works. When you get on there and you have 15 minutes to decide, it forces you to make a decision. It clarifies your decision-making process. And maybe it gets you to get off the couch, choose where you're going to stay, and commit to something. And with that, uh, we're coming to the end of another episode of FOMO Sapiens. As always, you can check me out at my website, patrickmcginnis.com. A lot easier to spell than Vana Kutsumitas. <laughs> patrickmcginnis.com. And there you'll find all kinds of information, my social links, information about the 10% entrepreneur. And if you want to reach out to me and maybe suggest your own faux moment of the week, you can reach me at let's connect at patrickmcginnis.com. So that's all for today. Until next time, uh, I'll see you later, FOMO Sapiens.